So user interaction in social data tell us a great deal about the real world. By understanding the time-dependent nature around the discussions in social media and public web, we're able to get, you're able to identify and even sometimes predict important real-world trends. Today, Christoph and I, Eric, are here to talk about Project Fortis, which is spirited towards accelerating humanitarian relief, all powered by Kubernetes. Uh, just a brief introduction of myself. Um, my name is Eric Schlegel. I'm a principal engineer for Microsoft. I work in a team called the Commercial Software Engineering Team. Um, my passion in terms of the projects I like to work on is how we can use emerging technologies uh, to help accelerate Microsoft's most innovative partners. And I'm Christoph Schitko. I'm an engineer on Eric's team. I'm kind of like you would think of the, the chronic early adopter. There's just something about working with undocumented software that attracts me. I'm not sure what it is, but I, I keep doing it, and I've been doing it for many, many years. Uh, you find most of my, my current work um, on my GitHub site at Compress, or um, you can reach me on Twitter as C the Architect. As Eric mentioned, um, we work on a team of commercial software engineers inside Microsoft. It's a very unique and special place to be. So our charter is about um, unblocking and accelerating innovation with all sorts of customers. We get to work with small startups, we get to work with large enterprises, we get to work with humanitarian organizations like the United Nations, and then this project will showcase some of that work, this talk will showcase some of that work. And, but we don't just engage with those customers. Um, we do this as an investment, so there's no charge when we engage. We really do this for, for the community and to, to accelerate the body of knowledge out there. The only string that we have that comes attached with our engagement is that we're able to talk about it, that we, that we contribute our knowledge back into the open source community. Um, so if you find yourself ever with a project that's, that's just a little bit scary and going into uncharted territory, um, you can give us a show. Maybe we can find a project that we can work on together. So the Project Fortis story started a little over a year and a half ago through collaboration with the United Nations, uh, specifically a team called OCHA. And this team, uh, this part of, of the UN is responsible for providing humanitarian relief for those that are in um, vulnerable need, that are in the midst of uh, humanitarian crises, and trying to provide that aid as quickly as possible. So to, fo to focus on a targeted scenario that they had at the, at the time was the post-Gaddafi situation, the, the refugee displacement situation in Libya. And their main, their main focus at that point was trying to get more insight around refugee displacement, terrorist attacks, famine that was occurring in that area. So at the time, their current process for trying to assess what the humanitarian situation was at the time was trying to manually grab, at the time was trying to manually uh, collect information related to a specific target set of topics in the area. So they were collecting Twitter feeds, Facebook feeds, um, public news sites, listening to radio broadcasts. Now this process was happening every single day by feet on the ground. And with this manual nature process, the aid plans became imprecise because the turnaround time it took, by the time that you actually collected this information and were able to assess the impact that was going on on the ground um, was, was a huge challenge at the time. So the other uh, obvious challenge is the amount of data sources that had to be manually created. And in areas like Benghazi, the availability is, is quite inaccessible because of the, the tumultuous situation that was happening there. So that team was operating out of Cairo because it was the closest place that they could access. So with Project Fortis, the main goal at the time was how do we accelerate the aid planning process? Well, one is to go, sit down with the operations team in Cairo and figure out what types of data sources they were collecting. So what we did was we figured, okay, if we were to, if we were to listen to all those data streams, Twitter, public web, 
radio, and being able to collect all that information and then being able to use a variety of different machine learning and NLP technologies and approaches to be able to do topical extraction off of that data, as well as to be able to identify the location that people are talking about, extract the sentiment from the conversation, being able to extract what organization is being mentioned, what person, what, what event. So the idea was that we would want to be able to identify atypical increases of mentions within those channels of information, and then being able to provide that level of insight to the aid planners so they can make an appropriate decision in terms of where they want to send their aid workers. Timing, is a, timing is, it was absolutely critical for our use case. So we wanted to build a, a data processing pipeline that was as near real time as possible. With Fortis, we were able to do a turnaround time in less than uh, 15 seconds in terms of when an event is actually um, tweeted to the time that we're able to process it, aggregate it, and be able to provide it on the dashboard. So what we wanted to do is build something that's repeatable, something that's adaptable to other scenarios. So we then take the, we took the same exact Fortis solution and we repurposed it through a collaboration with EMEA University and WHL to help identify and predict where Zika virus was spreading. So the way we did that was we took a look at weather forecast data to try to predict where mosquitoes were, were migrating towards, to then inference where whether those regions, those areas, were high-risk zones. Then layering in the social media data that we, that we currently have, on top of that, that weather, the weather pattern data, we're able to then assess if people are talking about fever or you know, Zika-like symptoms, and there's a high level of confidence that Zika is in this place. And then you could also layer in things like interventions where you have um, uh, health workers that are actually in there trying to, trying to remediate that, that, uh, the, the disease. So just to talk a bit about the functional architecture of Fortis. So we built streaming connectors all based off Spark, where we started collecting, we built real-time streams off of things like Twitter, um, Facebook, even Instagram, uh, and RSS feeds. And then also bring your own data source with Kafka, so that if there was custom data, you could just pump it into Kafka, and it would feed into the pipeline. And the other really cool thing we did was, we actually also tapped into radio feeds. So taking real-time, uh, audio streams that are coming in, converting that to text, and then being able to do entity extraction off of that. So our, our Kubernetes cluster is running on Azure off of Azure Container Services, and we're using Spark Streaming. So the data stream will come in. We would then distribute that data um, through, through Spark RDD partitioning. Then based on the, the events that people are talking about, we would then run some um, entity extractors to try to figure out mentioned places, even down to uh, a street level or corner or a uh, district or administrative boundary. And then we would tag the event to that place. So we then took a time series representation saying, okay, take a snapshot per minute, per hour, per day, per week, per month, per quarter of figuring out what was, what was the context of the discussion across all these verticals. This way that we, once we indexed it by geotiles, we're able to get both a spatial and a time-dependent view on a set of topics and entities. While using a variety of different cognitive services for uh, speech analytics and text analytics for sentiment, we then used Lucene to do the, um, to do the, the, entity, um, the entity recognizer. So we built a whole bunch of analyzers within Spark and we filter the content based on a geofence that the user defined, and then we push the data into Cassandra. That data would then be served on an administrative dashboard, or on a user dashboard, and the backend APIs would be all based on GraphQL. And the reason why we did that is because we want to give the end user the flexibility to query the data however they want. So, our solution was built on, on Kubernetes. We wanted to run Spark on Kubernetes, and the main driver for why we wanted to do that is because we wanted to increase the resource utilization of all of our pods. We didn't want to have AVM 
just stood up to run a single Spark worker. We wanted to be able to maximize all the nodes we had within our cluster. We wanted to be able to decrease our operational costs as much as possible. Um, simplified deployment model as well. So we are, so one, one of the great advancements that's happening within the Spark and Kubernetes space is a project called Spark Native. We have a bunch of open source contributors that originated from uh, Bloomberg and Palantir and a bunch of other companies as well. And what this is, is it's, a, it's, a, it's a framework that allows you, it's a plug-in framework that they fork Spark so that it's a back-end scheduler where they have, they're able to talk directly to Kubernetes and schedule pods and elastically scale out the number of workers depending on the, um, the, the, depending on how that Spark job is progressing. So they provide a shuffle service where they're able to automatically scale that out and they provide a staging server where you're able to um, containerize your, your underlying data sources, your underlying Spark files. So the great thing about that is when you submit your Spark job, you specify your Kubernetes endpoint, and then Kubernetes acts as your, your driver. So the whole concept of the master pod within Spark completely goes away. We also, the, the other big driver for using uh, Kubernetes for Spark was Helm. So being able to have one single um, convention for deploying our, our stack, uh, as well as Deus for serving GraphQL and, and our React endpoint. Um, the streamlined developer experience, the kubectl, so one, tool, one CLI to monitor our entire cluster, and high availability. With, um, with, with it, this, allow, this freed us from having to use Zookeeper and minimize our, um, our, op, our operational management stack. And then the ability to elastically scale out um, our, our workers via the kubectl min-max replicas. And then also simplified our DevOps with being able to leverage tools like Prometheus and Spark and Spark dashboard and the uh, Kubernetes dashboard to monitor and log and to raise events in certain scenarios. So just to talk through a bit of the, the deployment model, um, all the code that with Fortis is all open source. So the way that we deploy a Spark job is once you cut a new release on GitHub, we that kicks off a Travis CI build. We then use simple build tool uh, assembly to generate the fat jar. We take that fat jar and then we post it to blob storage. And Christoph's going to talk more about um, the, the Kubernetes deployment. Does it come through now? Excellent. Then I can just give you this. Cool. So for the Kubernetes part of the conversation, um, first of all, working on a project like this that's deployed by the United Nations, I think, is, is a real um, it's a real way for us to make a difference, so it's, it's quite a, a piece of pride that we get to present here. Um, on the Kubernetes side, the, we've, we've worked on, on the deployment quite a bit. We started with the Helm charts that you find on, on the Kubernetes uh, repo, but uh, we made some, some interesting modifications to meet our needs. As, as Eric mentioned, um, density and just resource utilization was one of our goals. So. We're deploying two, uh, two namespaces um, into, into a single cluster. We have one namespace for Spark. We have one namespace for Cassandra. We modified the templates a little bit um, on the Spark side. We um, upgraded to the latest version 2.2. We're eyeing 2.3 at the moment. So, so we have um, Spark streaming and all the latest features available. And we also made some, uh, some changes in order to be able to kick off jobs as we launch the applications. So if you go to our, our Catalyst code repo, you will find a, a chart that has those modifications. Um, but from a Spark perspective, we, we run a single master that we kick off as a deployment. Then we have a, a stateful set uh, of worker nodes, work, um, yeah, executors <laughs> that, that run the Spark jobs. We also have the Cassandra nodes running in the cluster. And with Cassandra, we optimized the chart mostly with an eye on high availability within, within Kubernetes um, and optimizing that for how things run in Azure. Uh, we're also using stateful sets here because um, the, the uh, pod identity becomes very interesting when you try, uh, try to discover services. And, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, who's been in the keynote this morning? Everybody? Everybody saw Kelsey? Um, Kelsey was asking about spinning up Kubernetes jobs, uh, Kubernetes clusters. Um, he, he made it sound like a big deal because we use um, D3 
the Azure Container Service. And with the Azure Container Service, um, spinning up a cluster is kind of a, a one command line kind of, kind of ordeal. You type a bunch of letters and you wait five minutes and you have a cluster. Um, so the Azure Container Service is what, what we use, and we actually use a derivative of that. Um, it's a way to spin up a cluster, but that is your cluster. It's not managed by Microsoft. Uh, you're, uh, you have some control over the configuration. It has, let's say, reasonable defaults for networking, for the distros, for, and, and, and so on. But if, if you have advanced configuration needs like so, some of our customers do, for example, they want to run um, a GPU enabled VM, or they have a very special distro that they want to run on. They have a, I don't know, a special version of CoreOS, for example. Um, we also have what we call the ACS engine that is a way to run or provision very advanced configurations of, of Kubernetes clusters, all the way down to um, controlling the, the pod siders, the, the, the service networks, and so on. So you get to customize the address space, which um, we also did for something we're going to talk about in a second. Um, you may have heard, just a little plug for our employer, um, we have the AKS, the Azure Container Service with a K, not with a C. Um, this is a, a fully managed service where Microsoft will maintain the operating system, the Kubernetes runtime, and they won't even charge you for the masters. So you just pay for the agent nodes. Um, so much for that. So, uh, so Kubernetes for us is a just a, yeah, standing up the cluster is the <laughs> smallest of our, our worries. Um, we did some extensive research on how we how we configure the cluster um, for, from a, from a networking and benchmarking perspective. And wow, well, this is reformatted again. Um, the benchmark that we're running is taking activity data, so data about people going on runs and bicycle trails and stuff like that, and produces heat maps from that. So here on the slide you see heat maps for people going running or bicycling in Austin. Um, it's a rather large data set that we use to benchmark, and we have a, a configuration that, that exercises the network and, and avoids co resource contention. So we have a, um, a Kubernetes cluster where we run Spark, and we have virtual machines where we run um, Cassandra. Of course, they're connected via the network. And we, the Azure CNI plugin that was, was fairly new um, throughout our project, it came out sometime this summer. Um, we wanted to compare that to Calico, which, which um, many of our customers were using. So we still get a good, good performance advantage out of the Azure CNI of about 10, 15%, which is kind of what, um, what people expect when, when you compare native networking to, to Calico. So um, we were quite happy that this was indeed the result that we expected going into the benchmark. Uh, so our cluster is now configured for running Azure CNI. Um, we also did quite a bit of work around high availability, specifically with, the, with regards to the Cassandra setup. And I don't know you're probably familiar with the, with the concept of fault domains, where your cloud provider will um, make sure that your virtual machines are truly highly available. Because um, when we provision for high availability, we typically say, okay, we're going to provision more than one, maybe two or three virtual machines, and we hope that things go right. Now, there's a little bit of trickery to that, because if you imagine you have three virtual machines and they all run in the same rack, and that one rack has a problem, like somebody trips over the power cord, hopefully not, um, so, or um, the top of rack switch goes bad, then all three VMs would be unavailable and your application would essentially be, be not there. Um, the same is true for containers. Um, the, the way we're placing containers in a cluster. And I had this conversation very recently with, with a, an engineer over at Mesosphere. Um, just because you're deploying more than one replica into a container doesn't necessarily mean that you're highly available because, or into a cluster, doesn't necessarily mean you're highly available because even if you have three replicas of, let's say, um, Cassandra running, if all of those replicas were running in the same rack, and that rack has a problem, then you still have an issue, and the high availability setup um, wasn't as good as it should have been. 
So what we did, um, Cassandra has some built-in high availability um, features that when you tell Cassandra where the racks are and where, uh, where the data centers are, it will automatically place data across the ring um, so that even if a single node has a failure, all the data is replicated across the ring. We also had some extra um, set up in the, in the chart that we made sure that we only have one Cassandra, kind of Cassandra pod running on each node just to make sure we, have, we don't have duplication and we truly have the key space replicated across the, the entire cluster multiple times. Um, the, the feature in Cassandra is the gossiping property file snitch. I think that's a great word um, that, that we configured. If you running with a, a uh, that we configured in a custom, custom container image that we have out on, on Docker Hub right now, um, EC2 has their own snitch and we should probably write our own at some point. But for, for Azure, this works actually quite well. So this enabled us to uh, do a, a multi-Azure data center setup for, for high availability. We can now um, take that container because it has the, the data center information and the rack information baked into each Cassandra image. I can take that and deploy that into two data centers. So I bring up two data centers, um, I bring two Kubernetes clusters, I will then provision a single Cassandra um, ring across those with a single line of script. So that's actually kind of, um, we were quite proud to, to show that. Um, but not everybody wants um, two a Azure data centers. We have some customers that say, okay, we have actually um, our own data center that we would like to do high availability, and can you stand up a cluster that is a, would be a hybrid Cassandra ring over our on-prem bring the uh, Cassandra that we already have and extend that into the cloud. And we can certainly do that with the, net the networking connectivity features that we have between a cloud provider and an Azure. So in this case, it would be Azure Express Route that would connect the, the on-prem environment and the cloud environment to form a single network. And then we can bring up Cassandra on those, on the two, uh, two clouds. The last one um, we thought we'd show is our, our work in progress. And we learned in the keynote this morning that uh, multi-cloud is, is, is a big deal. So <laughs> we were looking at it like, yeah, that's, that's actually what we've been working on. So we, we have um, been experimenting with a multi-cloud setup for Cassandra, um, taking a, the half the cluster in, in Azure and half the cluster in another cloud, in AWS, and connected those two via, via a VPN connection and then bootstrapped our Cassandra cluster just to see how it works. Um, so the good news is, the, the very good news is I can actually show this because it, it did work. Uh -huh. Let's see if I can show this. So here we have terminals up, oh, why not? Here we don't have. Here we have um, SSH connections into two different, different um, virtual machines. One is running in Azure, the left one. The right one is running in AWS. If you, just to make sure you, you believe me, I can actually go to, I can go to the metadata service and this looks very much like an Azure VM that's running in, in our West US region. I can do the same over here. And you see this, oops, this is truly, uh, for instance type, I think it's instance type, yes. So this is truly an AWS VM. Um, the two are connected. So if you actually, if you can, you see the IP address over here, I can actually say something like ping 172.20.50.130.131. 
And surprisingly enough, um, even though we're connecting an, an Azure data center to an AWS data center, we have a latency for, uh, in, the, in the tens of milliseconds. So, so that's, that we feel quite confident is good enough to run a, a, a distributed cluster. So if I look here, I actually have Cassandra deployed. It's the same Helm chart that I have on my repo. Um, and I actually do have a Cassandra pod running over here. I do have, up. I do also have Cassandra pods running over here. And when I say something like, Cassandra, when I check the status of my cluster, you'll see I do have indeed, I do have indeed a data center, a, a two data center cluster, one here in AWS and one, and one half of that in, in our Azure data center. So now I have a single distributed Cassandra ring across two data centers. Let's see if this comes back. Um, and so you may ask how we did this and if we used Federation. Um, the answer is not yet. Um, currently because Federation is still a little bit early in its life cycle and we try to do something that, that was stable enough for customers to experiment with. We actually are looking for customers that would like to work with us on setups like that. So if, you, if you're interested in exploring multi-cluster configurations or multi-data center configurations, multi-cloud configurations, or know somebody that does, we would absolutely love to work with you. And as the, as the parting Parting slide, so to say. Um, everything we do is open and everything we do is on GitHub. So the, everything from the ingestion pipeline with Spark and Cassandra, that is yours to stand up, um, complete with the GraphQL based front end. Um, we have, of course, the multi data center, multi cloud configurations documented. We have the cross cloud networking documented and everything else. We also exp um, own a site on Microsoft.com called the Developer Blog. So if you go to microsoft.com slash developer blog, you will find um, lots of information about other projects that we're doing. So not just the humanitarian, but other, other work that we've done with, in the areas of artificial intelligence, computer vision, blockchain, uh, machine learning. I mean, pretty much anything that's interesting and, and, and a little bit out there right now is the stuff that we work on. So? Yes, um, the, the virtual guide dog. So um, using mixed reality to, um, as a virtual guide dog is, is a, was another project that we think is very interesting and, and has a very nice human, humanitarian aspect to it. I think we have um, five more minutes for questions. Um, so if you, if you have any, please ask away. No questions? But of course. Yes? Um, uh, yes. Sure. Sure. So we used, um, there's a, a speech SDK that comes with cognitive services. We built a protocol on top of that where we were doing real time uh, speech to text. So the, the API where it does speech attack, so pretty much um, the, uh, the Cortana API, ultimately. So we integrated that in real time within Spark. So we built a whole Spark streaming connector around that. The other one we used was sentiment, um, text analytics for sentiment analysis, and then computer vision. So what we did with that was for Instagram posts, whether it's uh, pictures or video, we would do object detection off of what is in the video. So you can imagine an ISIS flag or uh, AK-47, so being able, to, um, being able to, to tag that image as a piece of content that we would display in Fortis. Sure. So what we did was we, we, have, um, we have a copy of OpenStreetMap, 
and we use um, Lucene to identify what are mentioned places. So once we have a mentioned place, we then geotag that event to the shape of that place. So we then, um, within, within our Spark job, we then partition that event to all those different tiles from say zoom level eight to 18. Um, so we're basically able to get a time and space representation of that event. And we store it in Cassandra as a, as a, spatial, da as a spatial data set, basically based on a tile ID. And that's what drives the heat map. Yeah, so we were using stateful sets for our pods, um, for the worker nodes. Uh, as part of the Helm chart that we set up, you can, you can set that up with min-max uh, replicas based on CPU uh, limits. But uh, with Spark Native, that's already baked into the Spark Native engine itself and their, their schedule uh, service. So what they do is they take a look at all the tasks that have to, get, um, that have to, that have to basically get scheduled out and they take a look at what the Kubernetes load is, and then they figure out exactly if they have to create any more uh, worker node pods. Uh, but Spark Native, according to the according to the author of Spark Native, they're trying to get that um, merged back into the upstream in Spark 2.3. I don't know when that's going to be, but so that Kubernetes will be naturally um, integrated with Spark. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all for attending.